Um, so I'm going to give an overview of the idea of kind of quant device independence in quantum crypto. And you're welcome to ask me questions all the time through. Um, there's also kind of a cheat sheet for those of you who are not uh, uh, quantum, and I'll kind of refer to this. Um, so like I said, I'm going to give an overview talk about, um, I guess, wait. Uh, about the idea of device independence in quantum crypto. And uh, I guess uh, towards the second half, I'll also mention some new results. Um, I will also mention some experimental results. Do not be scared. There will only be one slide on this um, in this talk. <coughs> All right. So what's going on here? So um, I'm going to talk about, like I said, device independence. And I guess all the quantum, non-quantum people here are probably wondering kind of what is this device independence. I'll talk about device independence in quantum key distribution, where I guess the concept originates. And I'll talk then about device independence for arbitrary protocols. Okay. So the question that kind of device independent asks is, how can we hope to be secure if we actually have no idea what's going on inside our quantum device? Okay. So I guess the devices that people build um, in the lab, they actually use, look something like this. <laughs> uh, so it's very messy. So even if you are an experimentalist, I guess there's none of them here, um, you're not quite sure that things have really been correctly implemented. You know, maybe some of these mirrors and lasers, they don't really work the way you intended them to. I mean, it's a practically implemented system. Um, of course, for me, being a theorist, I'm not even able to build these kind of devices. In fact, I have to ask one of my experimental friends to make them for me. But who trusts them? You know, like, uh, so the question is kind of like, how can I be secure if I actually get a quantum device that's made by someone else? Okay. So the assumption of kind of device independence is thus to say that we have no idea what's going on inside. Um, we would like this device to make certain measurements. Okay. So the device prepares a state. And I guess for the non-quantum people, this is just a positive semi-definite matrix of trace one. I would like it to make certain measurements. And the measurement is nothing else than a collection of positive semi-definite matrices that add up to the identity. And I can observe outcomes with some probability. There's kind of an easy rule for that. So this is kind of the probability of observing outcome x if I measure rho. Okay. So this is what I would like my device to do. But really, my device looks more like this. Okay. So the model of device independence is that I can only choose a measurement setting. So I can control all the classical software, because the idea is that I can write code on my computer myself. So I can tell the device to please make this measurement, or please make that measurement. I have no idea what the state is or what the actual measurements are inside the device. But I can record some kind of classical measurement outcome. Okay. I guess given that I have the device, on my table. I might use it also many times. Okay, so I might kind of so randomly choose some, some measurements and observe, record some outcomes to try and get some confidence of what's going on inside. Yeah? Yeah, so actually in this talk, I will assume that the world is described by quantum mechanics. So there is a quantum mechanical description of the device. I should say that quote, device independence actually goes beyond that. So there are also notions of device independence where people say, huh, you know, maybe all this quantum formalism is also bullshit. Like, I don't trust that the world is quantum mechanical. But maybe I believe in other physical principles. For example, that I cannot communicate faster than the speed of light. So there are kind of more general models than the ones that I'm going to discuss here. But I will actually assume in this talk that kind of quantum mechanics describes the world. And therefore, what's going on inside the device is described by some quantum states and measurements. It's just that I don't know what they are. Okay. More questions about the model? Right. Good. OK. OK. <laughs> so I guess I, I said we're going to do device-independent cryptography. And cryptography usually involves an adversary. 
And like I said, because I don't know what's going on inside my device, the, more the idea of device independence is to actually assume that the device has been constructed by the adversary. Okay. So for example, if I want to defend myself against an eavesdropper, I'm actually, we're going to assume that in fact this eavesdropper has produced these devices herself. So the adversary can prepare the devices. There will be some interaction between the devices and the eavesdropper afterwards. And I'll talk about that. Um, and in principle, like the eavesdropper may have some classical or quantum information about the device. And I'll call that information E. Okay? So for example, like an eavesdropper that just has classical information about the device has recorded like the blueprint of the device. And like this is how it actually functions. This is the actual state and measurements. But in general, like we allow that the eavesdropper actually has an arbitrarily large quantum computer and a super large quantum memory and can sort of be entangled, in fact, with the device itself. All right. So typically in device independence, in fact, we will have more than one quantum device. Okay? So there will be a few devices. And each of them, I guess, we can give inputs and observe outputs. But we are often going to uh, assume some guarantees about these devices, namely, for example, that they don't talk to each other while we test them. Okay, so I can have more of them. I can put them on my table, but they can't talk to each other. Okay. And I guess the general goal of device independence is to certify certain properties of these devices, um, maybe the exact shape of the states or the measurements, but I guess for cryptography, you really want, what you really want to do is to certify certain input-output behaviors of the devices, possibly involving also the eavesdropper. And I guess all cryptographic applications of device independence really are of this form. So we want to perform some test, and we want to be sure that some subset of the measurement outcomes produced by one of these devices satisfy a certain property, namely that they're difficult to guess for the eavesdropper. So I'm not going to define this here, I guess, because most of you don't know quantum, but this guessing probability is nothing else than the probability averaged over the choice of x, um, that the eavesdropper guesses x by making a measurement on his or her quantum system. Okay. Quantum system can be possibly arbitrarily large, and uh, there's no restrictions to the computational power or, to, or the time that this measurement might take. Okay. And typically, like, there will be some constraints imposed by the protocol on top of that. Um, so, so in, indeed, so we will uh, quite often kind of, actually for all the cases that I'm going to consider in this talk, private randomness is free. We can, we have a source of private randomness and we can use it for testing. Okay, so like in fact, part of this private randomness will be leaked to the attacker. So I'll explain that. So in fact, like the, you can think that all the randomness that we're actually going to use for testing, we're later going to give it to the attacker. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's initially <laughs> private, so the if server doesn't know it yet when the devices are made. Okay. So I guess the most well-known idea kind of of, uh, of of quantum cryptography, which you're probably all familiar with, is this task of quantum key distribution. And I guess it doesn't need some much introduction. So there's, I guess, Alice and Bob, as usual. And the task that they want to solve is that they want to produce a secure encryption key. And um, uh, in fact, they want to, I guess, do produce such an encryption key in the presence of an eavesdropper who is actually all-powerful. So this um, eavesdropper has a quantum computer, an arbitrarily large quantum memory, and essentially can perform all actions instantaneously. Okay. So Alice and Bob have some resources. In particular, they're connected by a classical authenticated channel. Of course, the question is, where does this come from? So usually it's assumed that they actually share a little bit of key in advance. So quantum key distribution, strictly speaking, is quantum key expansion of a, of a small initial key. And we will give them a quantum channel. Okay. So Eve can, of course, tamper arbitrarily with this quantum channel and ent entangle herself in some arbitrary fashion. Okay. So quantum channel means that Alice, you can think that Alice and Bob can send qubits back and forth. And there's no restriction to if if can temper arbitrarily with that channel. Okay. 
So the goal is, I guess, in key distribution, as you're familiar with, that Eve knows nothing. So we want to produce kind of a key, which I'll call K. So this is a quantum information way of saying that the key is uniform and uncorrelated from the eavesdropper. And this like little twiggle, um, I guess classically you would use the statistical distance. Um, in quantum information you use something called the trace distance, but it captures exactly the same idea. Namely, if two states are close in trace distance, then they're difficult to distinguish by any measurement. Okay, so I don't need to say much about the history of QKD, but um, the, the idea of device independence, I guess, is already a little bit baked in into some, I guess, early versions of, of, of ideas about of, of quantum key distribution that relate quantum cryptography or the security thereof to something called um, Bell's theorem. Okay. And I will give you a little bit kind of the approach of this way of looking at of quantum key distribution on a high level, because it quite naturally connects to the idea of device independence. So I guess you've all heard about this uh, thing called entanglement. Um, and I guess the key idea here is that, in fact, maximum entanglement implies maximal privacy. So let's for the moment assume that Alice and Bob somehow share a maximally entangled state, which we like to call the EPR pair kind of looks like this, a superposition of 0, 0, and 1, 1. It's not important to kind of what this notation means here. Um, but it's important to understand certain properties of the state. Okay. And in particular, the key properties of the state is that if we somehow can be could be sure that Alice and the quantum state shared by Alice and Bob is this EPR pair, then we know that in fact Eve has to be completely uncorrelated from them. So kind of entanglement is monogamous in the sense that if Alice and Bob are maximally entangled, then nothing else in the universe, in particular the eavesdropper, can have any share of the entanglement. We, the entangled state has this nice property that in fact if Alice and Bob make the same measurement, they always get the same outcome. Okay, so they, they can be correlated with, them, with each other, so we can produce a key, the protocol will be correct. But whatever measurement Alice makes, also the outcome will be uniformly random. So it's not decided in advance. Okay? So in particular, the eavesdropper who is uncorrelated has no way of finding out this random outcome. Okay. So if they only had this beautiful state, then they could produce a bit of key by making a measurement. It would be completely uncorrelated from the eavesdropper. Okay. So the idea, I guess, um, of of one of the ideas of quantum key distribution that leads to device independence is to now say, aha, maybe they can perform some kind of test to convince themselves that the states they have are close to this kind of magical EPR pair. Okay. And there is a kind of test for that, which is um, known as a Bell test. And there's many versions of this. And it's nice to think about them as a game. And I guess from computer science perspective, you can think that Alice and Bob here are some provers, and you're kind of playing a game against them. You're doing some kind of test, like in an interactive proof system, such that you can convince yourself that kind of the state that they really have has certain properties. So the CHS edge game is very simple. So um, I've painted here A and B, so you should be thinking about A as B as these magic unknown boxes that just have input-output behavior. Um, they have private randomness, and they can use this randomness to choose measurement settings on these <coughs> devices. Okay. Okay. So Alice kind of chooses a measurement, say zeta, Bob chooses a measurement, um, zeta b, and they obtain some outcomes which are called x and y. And the test that we're going to do, like the winning condition, is so kind of if we think about this as a game, like interactive proof against Alice and Bob, then they win if and only if the product of their kind of inputs is equal to the sum or two of the outputs. Okay. And the question is now kind of, what's the probability that they win this game? Okay. So actually, for the purpose now, just imagine that the boxes work IID, they do the same thing, so you might do this many times, and somehow estimate this winning probability. You mean the same inputs? Yeah, so like um, um, if I were to later assume the device is IID, I guess this would be fine. Um, but actually, I'm not going to assume that. I'm going to, in fact, allow the devices to have memory and so they can remember what comes before. Okay. 
So what's up with this game? So the point is that kind of if the boxes would just have classical shared randomness in them, then in fact the winning probability is at most three quarters. Okay, so Alice and Bob cannot talk to each other like an interactive proof system, non-communicating proofers. This is the maximum that they can do. It turns out that if Alice and Bob have the maximally entangled state inside these boxes, then there exist certain measurements that allow them to win the game with much larger probability. In fact, with a probability up to around 85%. Excuse me? They need to have entanglement. They need to have entanglement, yes. And in fact, I guess this is also kind of the key point here, is that if they have entanglement they, and certain measurements, then they can reach this 85%. But the kind of cool thing that I guess now leads to device independence is that the converse is to some extent also true. So in fact, we know that kind of, let's for the moment assume that we actually do know the measurements, let me bracket it out, uh, that if I observe a maximum CHSH violation, meaning a winning probability of these 85%, then in fact, there's only one possible state that can be inside these boxes, which is the EPR pair. Okay. So you can already kind of see that this gives you a way to test for this EPR pair. And of course, if we have the EPR pair, then we know that kind of Eve is ignorant about the outcome and they could use this as a key. So of course, as you might imagine, reality is not so nice. So usually, they will just observe some CHSH violation, some winning probability, but not quite 85%. We will have some imperfect DPR pair. Eve will not be ignorant about the outcome, but just, I don't know, somewhat ignorant about the outcome. So you cannot correctly guess the outcome. So there will be some mean entropy, I guess, but not, she will not be completely uncorrelated. And we might not use this immediately as a key, so we have to then apply some randomness extraction. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to do this many times. So that's right. Actually, let's, let's for the purpose uh, of illustration, assume that, in fact, they're independent. It is possible to, in fact, show, but it's highly non-trivial. I guess I'll give you some pointers in a moment. Um, that also, if we do this test sequentially, um, then even though the our devices have arbitrary memory on the inside, and in fact, the devices might even communicate in the middle, um, that uh, nevertheless, kind of, if we observe a certain number of CHSH wins, so this is all you can ever do in a finite N experiment, that kind of um, the probability that we see more than some threshold of wins and the min entropy being very small, that probability is very tiny. More questions? So I guess you've already seen now what the idea is of quantum key distribution, kind of one kind of cartoon version of looking at it is to say that Alice um, actually says to her device, please make the EPR pair. Let's send, I don't know, the B qubit over to Bob. Of course, Eve might now mount some kind of attack. In fact, she might entangle herself with the system somehow. <laughs> um, and then, well, they keep doing this many times, okay? So like, um, they test in each round, they decide to test, um, they, or otherwise they kind of try to use the round as making key, and they do this many times and they count the number of CHSH wins. Okay. Okay. And of course, I guess um, there will be some kind of classical post-processing, you might imagine some, um, they might want to do error correction, um, and they need to do privacy amplification in general. So why do we need to do these things? Um, of course, the first one is to ensure that also honest Bob can learn the key, because I told you that ha, this beautiful state, if they have the state and they make the same measurement, they get the same outcome. This, of course, is not quite true if they don't have the imperfect EPI either. So to ensure correctness, we need to do error correction and to kind of produce a key that is really close to uniform and uncorrelated, we do just like classically privacy amplification. It's actually not obvious that all kind of classical extractors work against what's called quantum side information. But for example, two universal hash functions are known to have this property. Okay. So I wanted to kind of give you some pointers, I guess, of this introduction to device independence and also move on to some new things. But before I do that, I want to, I guess, quickly mention that in fact it is possible to do such bell tests with what is called loophole free. So you can kind of think that if we um, perform this test, um, 
The first thing that I said is that these boxes, Alice and Bob boxes, cannot communicate during the test. Okay? So this kind of means, is there some physical principle that might guarantee that? So one physical principle is to just put the boxes far apart enough. So we kind of know that in the time that we give the input and observe the output, there was no way for information to travel from A to B. Okay. Of course, you might just assume that um, um, if you want to, but the question is, can it be guaranteed? And the second one is, I guess, I've shown you these complicated devices, and I guess many of these experiments are done using photons, so you can think that, yes, maybe the outcome should be zero, one, but there might also be an outcome where nothing happens at all, like there's no detection event recorded, um, and in this case, you can think that we actually play a game not with outputs zero and one, but also with a game of, I don't know, I don't know, or a board, okay? So this, of course, can influence our ability to test this entangled pair. So there's these two problems. One of them is called a locality loophole, meaning that they're too close together. And one of them we call a detection loophole in the sense that like, we don't have sufficiently high detection efficiency. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. I, I guess um, I, was, um, uh, I was shortly going to mention the experiment. Actually, maybe I'll show you the picture of the experiment. And, uh, like, I only have one slide on this because I thought no one is really interested in the experiment. But I can tell you a little bit how the experiment works. Okay? Um, so this is a picture of uh, TU Delft campus. So here on the left, uh, you can see a diamond. So actually, these, Q the, um, these diamonds are stored in nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. There's one, I guess, where our offices are. There's one at the very far end, just below where it says quantum internet, um, in the nuclear reactor in Delft, and you see kind of a bright spot in the middle. Okay? So what actually happens is that like, uh, the, each of these diamonds sends a photon to this intermediary point, uh, at which point there is the opportunity to create entanglement between Alice and Bob. Okay? So you can think that actually what we're doing in this experiment is we play a three-player game, where there's Alice, Bob, and the station in the middle. They're all separated, so they cannot communicate <coughs> during the experiment. And the middle station says, yes, we made entanglement, or no, we didn't make entanglement. And we can later post-select basically safely, in fact, can be proven on the yes, we made entanglement. And basically, we look whether Alice and Bob satisfy the winning condition only for the rounds where we made successfully created entanglement between them. I don't know, I, 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 I see this does not quite answer your question, but I'm very happy to talk to you more about it afterwards. Okay. I should say there's many ways to create entanglement. There's also an option where kind of the source is in the middle and it sends photon to Alice and Bob and they just measure them. There would also be an option where Alice actually sends a photon to Bob. Yes. Okay. So like I said, I guess given there's an overview, there's actually a whole zoo of device independent uh, literature out there and device independent protocols, and they can be roughly distinguished by how much they assume about these black box devices. Okay. So like I said, we can observe inputs and outputs. Um, typically, we will assume that we use these devices in sequence, meaning that I will only give the next input once the previous outcome has been observed, even though in fact it is possible to make some statements about the parallel use of devices. Um, like I said, device is arbitrary, typically. Um, it usually does not communicate back to the adversary. And there are several levels of paranoia. For example, we can assume that the de devices behave IID. <coughs> we can assume that devices are at least independent, so they might behave differently, but they have no memory. We can assume that the devices only have classical memory going forward, like no quantum states being stored. Um, there's models where we allow full forward quantum memory, <laughs> arbitrary quantum memory. Uh, and there's also models where we actually say that between each round, the devices can also communicate classically or quantum. Okay. So I should say, I guess, maybe there's more practically minded crypto people in the audience here. Of course, uh, let me say one thing. It is very beautiful that we can show security even if they send classical or quantum communication to each other during the rounds. But of course, you could say, if Eve prepares this device and they can somehow send classical or quantum information to each other in between whatever these trials, why not just send the key to Eve? Okay. If 
if I can put a radio inside the device, I might, of course, think about this, okay? So, like I said, I guess the later part is very beautiful that we can kind of prove security even there, but I guess in a practical context, you can think what this means. Okay. So, I guess um, the idea of kind of certifying states and measurements that I know that if I have maximum violation, I can say something about my measurement, actually is already somewhat implicit in the work by Zerosen, who actually proved this maximum upper bound on the winning probability. Okay. It's actually not hard to derive this, but I guess um, if we first need to digest quantum states and measurements, it would take us some time. So like I said, the point is that kind of if I have entanglement and what I call incompatible measurements, meaning more than one basis, then we can violate the Bell inequality, but the converse is also true. Okay, so if I observe a violation, then I know that I have entanglement and measurements with some incompatibility. And this has been generalized, actually, this testing of states and devices, I guess, goes back already to the 90s, and it's been generalized um, to a great extent in recent years. Of course, like I said, for quantum cryptography, the question is maybe I'm not really interested in the exact state or measurements which are inside. I'm only interested in what the distributions are that these states can generate. Okay. In particular, like I'm going to test something on Alice, I'm going to test something on Bob. They are somehow entangled with, with kind of Eve's devices. And in quantum key distribution, we can actually assume that, well, Alice sends something to Bob using her device. So we can kind of actually analyze this by saying, well, Eve just basically produced a global state for Alice and Bob in advance, with which she entangled, and they just go and measure, 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 measure. Okay. Right. So going back to Yevgeny's question earlier, in the case of QKD, in fact, so she has a quantum memory, she prepares the devices, she learns the measurement settings that were used to test, and she actually learns also part of these measurement outcomes. So I guess in this Bell test, you can think that Alice and Bob now check themselves what was our winning probability. So they don't, each, don't just tell each other the settings, but also the outcomes that have been produced. Okay. Okay, but at least here, there's kind of no quantum information going back. And at the end, of course, Eve can try and make a guess for the kind of remaining string um, using whatever other information she has gathered next to her quantum system, E. So we know a lot about device-independent QKD. This is definitely a non-exhaustive list. Um, uh, I guess the first kind of works looked at the case where the devices behave IID. Um, in fact, in the case of sequential use of devices, um, um, we can now have security against even the full, most fully parent, parent model. Um, in the case where, in fact, we assume that we know the measurement for Alice, but not for Bob. In fact, one can even show security in a fully parallel model. Um, yeah, so the main open question, in fact, in device-independent quantum key distribution is to show security for any violation of a Bell inequality. Okay, so all of these kind of analysis, well, at least the middle one assumes that I observe a winning probability that's significantly larger than this kind of magic threshold of three quarters. So there's many more uh, in applications of device independence. I guess I don't have time to talk about them, all of them. In particular, there's also the idea of device independent randomness certification. So I guess classically, like uh, we cannot generate, there's no deterministic process classically that can produce random numbers. And quantumly there is, so there kind of is a deterministic machine that produces random numbers. But the question is kind of, do I trust that machine? So in fact, it turns out that one can, to some extent, test um, not just kind of whether one is securing the IQKD, but also whether the randomness, whether the devices produce randomness under the assumption that I have these kind of separated devices. And here, of course, now kind of the amount of initial free, <laughs> plentiful private randomness, um, one needs to be very careful because, of course, I want to have more randomness in the end than I need it in order to test devices. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> so in the second part of this talk, I wanted to actually talk about some new results, kind of where we take the, the idea of device independence a little bit further. And we ask the question, 
is it possible to kind of test these devices also for other protocols that have been proposed in quantum crypto? Okay. And we actually have a general procedure that does this for also position, what's called position-based protocols. But here I will focus actually just on um, two-party protocols to kind of give you some idea of how this works. So I guess you all know kind of about two-party crypto. So here we want to do kind of, I guess, secure function evaluation. So just a brief brief, the task is as follows. Alice has an input X, which is known only to her, but not to Bob. Bob has an input Y, known only to him, but not to Alice. They want to compute some function F. So this, uh, what F is, is known to both Alice and Bob. And at the end of the day, kind of, they produce outcomes F of X and Y. Maybe sometimes only to Bob or to both Alice and Bob. So the goal is kind of of the protocol is that, well, here, in fact, it's unlike in QKD, where kind of Alice and Bob actually work together. They trust each other and they want to check on Eve. Here, for some reason, I guess, they don't trust each other anymore. So Alice does not trust Bob. And in particular, she wants to be sure that whatever Bob does from the output f of x and y, he cannot learn more about her input um, than he can infer, actually, by, by looking at f of x. And similarly, I guess Bob also tr doesn't trust, uh, trust Alice. <laughs> so he also wants to be sure that Alice cannot inform more about this input Y than she can infer by learning F of X and Y. Okay. So there's many examples, I guess, of such tasks. I guess for the present audience, I don't need to give you any examples. Um, so basically, I guess what we try to do is we try to build something like this magic orange box, which of course does not exist. So Alice and Bob want to solve this task by communicating over a classical or quantum channel. So if you want to do device independence here, you can already see that there's one kind of essential difference. So in the setting of QKD, we were to some extent in a very luxurious situation in the sense that there were these two devices, Alice and Bob, and they trusted each other. And they, in fact, also, I guess, could communicate over this classical authenticated channel, and they could use this to check. Okay. So here, of course, if I want to perform a kind of test with this Bob device, I don't know. Like, uh, I, mean, I mean, Bob might, <laughs> might tell me anything. In fact, he might, in this game, always use the zero input, um, or always use the one input, or have some arbitrary behavior. So because we cannot rely on the dishonest party to test, um, we will actually assume here that every party has themselves multiple devices. Okay. So Alice has kind of a device A, and in addition, she has some kind of, let me call it a test box, a second box by herself. And uh, we'll assume that, I guess, Alice can decide, say, if there's her device emits a quantum state, of possibly arbitrary dimension, whether that quantum state is kind of sent to the test box or to Bob. Okay. So if it goes to the test box, I call this a test round. If it goes to Bob, I'll call this a live round. So the question is now, I guess, who gets to prepare the devices? And just like uh, in the case of quantum key distribution, we will always assume that the kind of dishonest party prepares the devices. So in particular, if kind of Bob in this case is dishonest, he can produce, well, the device of A and also the test box. Again, Bob will kind of be able to learn these measurement outcomes. But apart from the fact that it's hard to test, there's actually one important thing that kind of distinguishes the analysis of device independence in these settings, or general crypto settings, from the setting of QKD, is that there's actually some quantum information going back to the adversary. Okay. So maybe just to be clear, in the case of QKD, we could actually assume that kind of Eve prepares the global state, row ABE, and then they measure and test, and measure and test, and measure and test. Here, because I guess the dishonest party and the honest party are combined together, um, and we, of course, always have to be correct. We have to give the honest party a uh, kind of a hope to, to, um, to actually learn <laughs> the desired output of the protocol. Um, we do need the devices to actually send quantum information also during the kind of test rounds to the adversary. Okay. So this makes this a little bit more complicated.
That's right, yeah. Yeah, so I should say that I guess I have have been a bit quick here, like in the case of um, of um, uh, QKD, um, one can reduce it to the case where we actually first do everything in parallel. So basically, first the kind of global state is distributed. So there's some giant state like of n qubits of Alice and n qubits of, of of Bob, and some I don't know, arbitrary state on Eve, and then Alice and Bob kind of proceed to test. So they kind of measure and record the measurement outcomes. And they will communicate some of these classical measurement outcomes to kind of check, but there will be no qubits, so to say, going back. Going back. So here, kind of, we, can, we cannot kind of assume uh, that there's, for example, some information traveling from Bob to Alice or the, or the, or the test box, kind of, um, where we could say first he prepares everything. Um, because note that, of course, we don't want Bob also to tell the test box that this is a test. <laughs> um, kind of, I guess you want to, uh, because you can only do it do a test, of course, if you cannot adapt the state to this idea. Okay. All right. So I'll say say a bit more about this in a moment. Okay. So I should say that, um, of course, um, you, the, there's maybe a slightly disappointing thing in the face of quantum key distribution. It was very satisfying because we could achieve extremely strong security guarantees. We could allow Eve an arbitrary quantum computer and an arbitrary quantum memory. So it turns out that, in fact, kind of um, in this two-party world, even quantum communication cannot give you security without making some assumptions. And it's actually somewhat intuitive that we might need to make some assumptions. Again, for the very reason that, well, Alice and Bob don't trust each other, so they cannot help each other to kind of test, test anything. Okay. So everybody's on, on his own, and yet to want to be secure. So it's been known for a long time, I guess, that uh, kind of bit commitment is impossible, or secure function relation is impossible in the quantum case without assumptions. There are certain kind of weak variants, which are kind of better than what one can do classically. Um, but I guess if, you, if I really wanted to commit a bit, I guess um, maybe I'd rather make an assumption. Okay. Okay. Of course, I guess you know that there's many classical assumptions where one can solve such tasks, like, uh, for example, computational assumptions. And there's also some physical assumptions. For example, um, Alice is actually split into two non-communicated parties. There's a channel with guaranteed noise. Or Alice and Bob have some kind of limit on their classical memory. So here, in fact, like um, when I'm going to have a look at some quantum assumptions, which are actually technologically quite well motivated. So there's models that say I cannot operate on all qubits at the same time, because maybe my quantum computer is not large enough. Um, I might again have some kind of guaranteed separation. So this is very similar to these classical models. Or I might assume that kind of my quantum storage is bounded or more generally noisy. Okay. So what we do actually kind of... Uh, applies to many of these models, but I'm going to focus on the last one here. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the case where we just have bounded storage. Okay, it's easy to count qubits. <laughs> I should say that actually counting qubits is, for most physical implementations, not a very good model because the state space can be infinite dimensional. Um, but let's just count qubits. And uh, so we're going to assume that the attacker cannot store more than a certain number of quantum bits. And this is technologically actually quite well motivated. Right now we can store roughly five for several milliseconds. But of course, kind of in a few years, maybe we can store hundreds of them. Okay. Right. So the goal here is to kind of find protocols that can be very easily implemented, in particular that do not require any quantum memory to be executed. Um, in fact, one can show that, at least using trusted devices, that security is in fact always possible for any memory assumption, we just send more qubits and make it secure. And the nice thing maybe about these models is that security cannot be retroactively broken. So if kind of tomorrow you buy, I don't know, a terabyte of qubits, um, and today I assume that you only have a, I don't know, gigabyte of qubits, then I remain secure. Okay. So I guess it's sort of clear, but let me maybe summarize what this model actually is. We're going to assume that kind of um, um, the adversary is computationally more powerful. 
Um, he has an unlimited amount of classical storage. He actually has a quantum computer and his actions are instantaneous. So the only thing we're going to assume that during certain waiting time in the protocol, his ability to store quantum information is limited. Okay, so kind of before this waiting time starts, he can do an arbitrary complicated measurement um, um, to obtain some classical information. And he might do an arbitrary encoding on all of the qubits at the same time. Okay. This would require, of course, a quantum computer and generally would take some time, but he has all that time. Okay. And afterwards, he kind of stores it. And I guess this is just a quantum information way of writing a storage channel from kind of input to output. Okay. All right. So like I said, there's this kind of general task of kind of secure function evaluation or bit commitment. But I'm going to focus here on a very primitive version of a task that I guess um, is sort of designed, in fact, inspired by QKD protocols. And the nice thing about analyzing this task is that it's kind of universal by itself. Okay. So this task is, um, let me be very informal here, um, again as follows. So we can think of the ideal behavior as a kind of orange box which we'll call string erasure or weak string erasure. And it provides Alice with a string, x1 up to xn. It provides Bob with a subset of the indices 1 up to n. And um, the elements of the string x corresponding to the elements in the subset. In fact, this subset, I guess, if they're honest, will be randomly chosen. Yeah, so I guess indeed, so it's, I guess you can think it's kind of inspired. It would be a randomized version um, uh, where Bob can learn kind of a subset of the, of the indices, but not all of them. It's a little bit uh, different from private information retrieval in the sense that here I'm not going to allow Bob to decide which the subset is. So it's randomized in both, both directions. So if Bob is honest, then I guess Alice should not learn anything about this index set. So she does not learn which are the bits known to Bob. And of course, like I said, even though Bob can learn a subset, like roughly half the bits if these are randomly chosen, nevertheless, his ability to guess the entire string, given whatever classical information, and this is I guess, the quantum information from his storage device, is large. Okay. And what we know about this is that it's kind of universal. Like if we augment it with classical or quantum communication, we can in principle do anything. And we know that at least using trusted devices, um, uh, we can achieve security for essentially any storage assumption. Okay. In particular, I guess if you think about bounded storage, then security can be achieved in weak string erasure, meaning we have positive min entropy, um, as long as the number of qubits that the adversary can store is less than n. This is the number of qubits transmitted minus just the logarithmic number of qubits. So you can also read this the other way around. If I have a certain number of qubit storage, how many bits n do I need to send in order to achieve security? So this is, I guess, more complicated to show. Somewhere in the past, in fact, we have made a link where we related security, meaning a bound on the min entropy, um, to just the attacker's ability to store classical information. And this is just the probability that the attacker sends a classical message at the rate given by this min entropy through the storage channel F. Okay, so this relates kind of how well can this memory preserve classical information. This is sort of a naive analysis, but it's kind of nice. I want to give you as an example here, even though we know something better now, because now we can still just think about the min entropy that Bob or adversary has about X given classical information. Okay, so we can think, in fact, if you want to think about these boxes, that in fact kind of what we'll do is kind of Alice produces an X and Bob will produce a K and we're not going to worry about any quantum information. <coughs> so there's a very simple entanglement based protocol for weak string erasure. Um, like I said, for the non-quantum experts, uh, maybe it's a bit difficult, but let me just, given what I've said before, explain why this works. Okay. So Alice prepares this EPR pair of two qubits and she sends one of these qubits to Bob. Okay. Now, Alice randomly measures in two what's called BB84 bases. These are the same bases used in quantum key distribution. Um, 
you can think that basically, I guess, if you want to think about polarization, either this direction or, or that direction. And Bob also randomly measures in a basis. Okay, so they both choose random basis and they measure. So remember that this EP upper had this nice property that if they measure in the same basis, they get the same outcome. Okay, so whenever they somehow agree, the honest parties agree, then they produce the same outcome bit. So you can think that kind of if both parties are honest, Alice produces a string X, namely the one by measuring her EP pair. Bob gets a random subset of the string X, namely all of the indices where he measured in the same basis. And in fact, I guess after n rounds to help Bob identify which are these sets that he measured in the same basis, after the waiting time where the storage assumption is applied, Alice is actually going to tell Bob these bases, and then he can form this index set. Right. So I guess I don't have the time much to talk about this. Um, you can kind of think that the storage assumption here is important, because note that we want Bob not to be able to guess the entire string. So if he did have perfect quantum memory, he could, of course, just wait to receive all the basis information, measure everything, get the whole string. So basically, something magic has to happen, a storage assumption, during this waiting time. T. Okay. Okay. So the point that I just want to make here is that, I guess, you see here that there's some quantum information going, going to the honest party, Bob. Okay. So, Security against this honest Alice is very easy to show because there's never any anything going from Alice to Bob. <laughs> um, even if Alice prepared Bob's devices, because we assume they don't have a radio inside, there's nothing coming back from Bob. So it's kind of the easy part. Alice cannot learn the index set. But the difficult part is what happens if Bob is dishonest. Okay. So like I said, in this regime, we're gonna imagine that this honest Bob prepares the devices and in, in essence, in every round, Alice can have a switch, kind of her device pretends, says, I pretend to generate a qubit. I don't know, it might not even be a qubit, it might be in high dimensional state. And Alice can decide to either kind of direct it to her test box or to direct it to Bob. Okay, so that's a very good question. So Alice does control the switch. Yeah. So actually, this is very important, I guess, which is why I've, uh, yeah, thank for the question, this is why I've made it a separate box. Okay. So Bob can prepare the device of Alice, the test box and his own box, but Alice must have control over the switch. And the reason for that is, like I said, if the, if the test device knew whether we actually send it to Bob or we use it to test, then of course it could behave differently depending on that information. This is kind of a little bit different than in QKD, where basically all the states are already there, and then they can kind of decide themselves which ones to test. Um, uh, but there's no, uh, um, there's no information kind of traveling out on, on what the test is. Okay. Yes? Uh -huh. Um, yes, so actually I will consider several models now. Um, let me get, get to that question, okay. So the first analysis that we did there is I guess just like in QKD, which is kind of the naive analysis, where we actually assume the devices don't have any memory, in particular also not whether I was tested. Okay. And there actually it's quite simple to obtain a bound, and I guess maybe for the quantum information people here it's quite simple. If we assume that they are IID, then of course we can estimate this probability of uh, winning CHSH. One can estimate a certain property of the measurements, namely that they anti-commute or they anti-commute on the state that has been prepared. And one can easily show how this kind of anti-commutation relates to some uncertainty, meaning that it's difficult to guess the outcome. That's right. So, so actually, so here, let me let me say one thing. Sorry, I was a little bit unclear. So I do behave that they assume the device is high ID, but Bob is allowed to capture all of the qubits immediately and save store them until the very end. So that's actually allowed. Sorry, I wasn't quite clear about that. 
So the device behaves IID, but Bob nevertheless can wait until all the qubits arrived, perform an arbitrary operation on them collectively. That's allowed. That's right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's why you're saying you wouldn't be able to get... That's right, yeah. So if, if he would not have a noisy storage device, but he could collectively store them in perpetuity, then in fact there would no be no security here in the case of trusted devices and also not in the case of kind of untrusted devices. So the, the noisy storage assumption says that um, during, I think it's easiest to think about it in terms of a waiting time. So there will be a moment in the protocol. He can do anything before, store all of the qubits, operate on them, quantum computer, I don't know. But at this waiting time, he has to use his quantum storage to keep quantum information around. So we can try and perform an error correcting encoding or measure part of it, I don't know what he does. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I guess it's kind of a tool to think, okay, this is now where this assumption is applied. All right, so maybe interestingly, kind of more importantly, in fact, security here is possible for any violation of the, of the Bell inequality. We have a more general result which relates to sequential attacks, and I'll say about this in a moment. And even though the kind of sequential attacks are somewhat unsatisfying, I decided to actually try and explain how that works in like one minute, because it's quite closer to your home. I should say we have some kind of new result um, where we actually also assume the devices are ID on Alice, but not on Bob, so he can do anything he wants. Um, uh, where we can also relate security, not just to this kind of naive classical bound, but really to storing quantum information. Okay. But now for sequential attacks, and I liked to kind of highlight this um, because it might be closer to what you're used to, <laughs> and um, I can explain the idea. Okay. So I'm now going to actually assume, Yevgeny, that he's not going to store everything that comes in. But for any, every transmission, Bob will immediately use a measurement device and produce a classical output. And I'll call this sequential guessing. So previously, just Alice in the test box behaved sequentially, like she puts an input, gives an output. Now I'm also going to assume this for dishonest Bob. Okay. I actually don't need to assume now that Alice's devices don't have memory. So it's nice in the sense that devices can have arbitrary memory, but everyone is sequential. Okay. So you can kind of think, if we think about these games, is that we're playing two games here. One of them is this, let me call it, post-measurement guessing game, in the sense that um, Alice, remember that Alice will later tell Bob what the basis was. So we can think without loss of generality that kind of Bob produces a classical outcome, which has two bits. Namely, one of them, which will be his guess if Alice later says, ah, I used basis number zero. And one of them will be his guess if Alice later says, well, I used basis number one. Okay. Um, so here, I guess, Alice and Bob win, if and only if Bob, kind of for the basis that actually Alice used, gives the right answer. So of course, you can now think that what we're actually doing here is we're combining this these two games. Okay? So you can think that what we're really playing is a game that just has two players. And we're going to choose randomly whether we challenge them to play the CHSH game or we, whether we play this post-measurement game. And now one can show that kind of if we play this sequentially and in effect devices have arbitrary memory, but everybody nicely uses them sequentially, that there's a relatively easy inductive argument to bound this success probability. And how this argument works is to observe that for any quantum state that Alice and Bob may have in any quantum measurements, there's a trade-off between the probability that they win the test game and the probability that they win the live game. Okay. I'm, I'm done. Okay. And there's a nice inductive argument, which I will, which I will kind of skip. Uh, because this holds for all states, it also holds for all states that have been prepared in the past. Okay, so condition on whatever happened before, this trade-off also holds for the next round, and that's kind of an easy argument. Okay. So we think we can kind of extend this, but um, this is in progress. So what we've done here is, um, like I said, I've shown you a little bit about device independence outside the realm of QKD. Um, like I said, these techniques that we've used here actually apply more generally to protocols. Um, the question is kind of, can all protocols be kind of tested in that way? 
can we certify kind of very general input-output behavior? And you already know something about input-output behavior from the beginning of my talk. So I told you that if Alice and Bob are maximally entangled, then they can violate CHSH maximally, maximum winning probability. And maximum winning probability implies that they're maximally entangled. But because of the monogamy of entanglement, we already know that kind of if they achieve 85%, then certainly they cannot, because they cannot be maximally entangled by the monogamy of entanglement. Okay? So you can kind of think that input-output behavior is kind of limited by these features of entanglement, and we can kind of generally use this to test. Okay. One can extend the idea of device independence to, I guess, make statements about nature if, uh, if uh, we don't completely trust quantum mechanics, going back to the earlier question, what we actually assume. Um, I guess if you're interested in the experimental things, we're currently working on, I guess, doing this on larger distances to set up some quantum internet in the Netherlands. So with this, well, I thank you very much. I guess this is where we are. If you're a master student, we now have a master program in quantum technologies. Thank you very much.